Welcome to Unexpected Climate Connections, Advancing Good Policy for the Economy and the Environment. My name is Jennifer Hollett. I'm the Executive Director of the Walrus, and I'll be helping out on stage today. Thank you for attendees throughout the morning, and I see some folks registering now. We're thrilled to be here in person in downtown Toronto in this beautiful open space at TELUS Harbour and streaming live across the country on the Walrus's YouTube channel. So hello to everyone who's tuning in online. A big thank you to the Max Bell School of Public, Public Policy for bringing us all together today and to TELUS and friends for welcoming us here to the building and space and for being just such fabulous hosts. Our hashtag for today is hashtag climate connections. We encourage you to use it to share insights from today's conversations on social, whether that's LinkedIn, X, Instagram, and feel free to tag the speakers that you see on stage, as well as the partners in together's event. Also to Wi-Fi, no surprise, uh, TELUS has you set up. So you can just log on, uh, the name of the Wi-Fi channel is hashtag TELUS, and then you'll receive a sign-in prompt. I'd like to begin by thinking about climate and the environment and nature by acknowledging the land. We're gathered within the bounds of Treaty 13, signed with Mississauga's The Credit. This land is also the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, Toronto is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And we're really honored to carry on a long tradition and history of storytelling. We encourage you to take a moment to reflect on the land that you're on, whether you're joining us here in downtown Toronto or online across the country and beyond. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the walrus. The walrus started really as an optimistic project over two decades ago to foster Canada's conversation. And we recognize that these conversations are complex important and oh so necessary. So for us, they take place in many forms at The Walrus, online at thewalrus.ca. We uh, also are available in print on newsstands or by subscription. This is hot off the presses, the cover, Toxic Workplaces. It usually receives a giggle because we've probably all been in one at some point in our life. And uh, we also have podcasts and we do events like this one in person and online. If you'd like to learn more about our work at the Walrus, we encourage you to stop by the table that you came across as you checked in. Uh, also, you can sign up for our free newsletters or subscribe directly. We're excited to join you in conversation, teaming up with Miguel's Max Bell School of Public Policy and TELUS for, I would argue, the issue of our time. I now would like to welcome to the stage a fellow Jennifer, Jennifer Shaw, Vice President Communications TELUS. Thanks again for bringing us together. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, game knows game. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, thank you for giving me the opportunity to welcome you here to TELUS Harbour uh, as we kick off this very important conversation today. At TELUS, our goal is to lead all corporate sectors, not just the telecom sector, in sustainability and our response to the climate crisis. We have a threefold world leading strategy that includes minimizing our carbon emissions and waste, investing in technologies to help Canadians live more sustainably, and becoming nature positive. TELUS is committed to using 100% renewable energy by 2025 and becoming a zero waste carbon neutral company by 2030. Currently, almost 100% of our electricity comes from renewable resources like wind, solar, and hydro. And we're on track to not only be net carbon neutral, but to also be nature positive as we work to restore natural ecosystems and boost biodiversity. We believe that this is not only good for the planet, it's good for business as well. I'm proud to share that TELUS is the leading social capitalism company in the world. Yes, that's right, the world. We invest and embed environmental considerations into every single facet of our operations. 
Caring for the environment is part of our DNA, and every year we give where we live. In last year alone, Team Telus, Team Telus volunteered over 1.5 million hours globally to build stronger, healthier, and more sustainable communities. We also doubled our commitment to the TELUS Indigenous Communities Fund. With a reconciliation strategy that follows the guiding pillars of connectivity, enabling social outcomes, cultural responsiveness and relationships, and economic reconciliation. We continue to push for innovation and creativity through responding to the needs of Indigenous communities. In April 2023, we also celebrated the planting of our one millionth tree. And with our TELUS Pollinator Fund for Good, we support reforestation efforts and bring nature-based solutions to help impact the effects of climate change. Forest fire season, unfortunately, are starting earlier and earlier, while becoming increasingly intense and damaging. That's why we've partnered with Flash Forest, an innovative Canadian company that is rapidly scaling post-wildfire reforestation solutions, leveraging exciting drone-based technology. It's also why we partnered with Dryad, a German startup that provides ultra-early wildfire detection through large-scale networks and sensors that detect smoke while a fire is still smoldering. Our investment will help Dryad further expand and scale into the US and in, into Canada. The urgency of our environmental challenges mean we are actively investing in energy efficient and revolutionary technologies, optimizing our processes and aligning our fi financial decisions with environmental goals. As part of that transition to energy efficient technology, Last year, we celebrated a decade of TELUS Pure Fiber program, which oversees the transitioning from copper to pure fiber, a material that is 85% more energy efficient. We've also reduced more than 7,400 tons of greenhouse gas emissions while making our, more, our network more resilient to extreme weather events. Broadband internet infrastructure plays a vital role in combating climate change. At TELUS, we've been paying close attention to the research about just how interlinked connectivity and sustainability are. And the more we learn, the more evident it's, it's become that Canada needs a climate strategy that includes a strong digital policy. That's because broadband, internet, and digital technologies can enable a 20% reduction in Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. It's a massive gap that is equivalent to 40 to 60% of our 2023 Paris climate targets. But digital policy is not mentioned in the climate action plans of any G7 country, including Canada. This missing link presents an incredible opportunity for Canada to leverage digital solutions and be a global leader in our quest to mitigate climate change. Even though the research continues to mount and confirm that Canada needs digital policies to achieve our carbon reduction targets, telecommunications, and the connectivity we enable to power emissions reductions activities like remote work, smart manufacturing, and farming is completely absent from our national climate strategy today. It's why the conversation you're about to have is so pivotal to the future of our country and the global climate reality. Techn technology provides a critical solution to help address climate change and reduce emissions, but we need the policy to support it as well. Because it's been said over and over and over again, we are simply running out of time. And so to not waste any more time and enabling you to get back and start this very important conversation, I'll turn it over to Jennifer and I hope you have a great day. Jennifer, I have to say, as a TELUS customer, it was exciting to come into the building and just seeing what you're talking about in the building design in, in details. And I think today is all about connection and making connections between policy and technology and some of the other intersectional topics. So thank you for sharing that, that data, but the larger vision behind the work that TELUS is doing. I now would like to introduce the great mind behind Unexpected Climate Connections. Christopher Reagan is the founding director of McGill University's Max Bell School of Public Policy and was the chair of Canada's Eco Fiscal Commission. Please, a warm round of applause to welcome Chris to the stage. Thank you, Jennifer and Jennifer. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
In January of 2014, 11 economists, one lawyer, and three political strategists checked into a hotel in Wakefield, Quebec. Now, that is not the beginning of a raunchy joke. Uh, they had separate rooms. But um, they began work on what would soon become Canada's Ecofiscal Commission. The commission launched to the public in November of 2014, and its mandate, I'm a geeky economist, so its mandate in geeky economic terms was P squared, R squared. Price pollution, recycle the revenues. This is an old idea, <clears throat> at least 75 years old, if not more. Uh, but it was not one that was used much in practical policymaking in Canada. The group was convinced that it would be good for Canada's environment and its economy if our governments at all levels used more policies like this for water pricing, for garbage pricing, for congestion pricing, for pricing environmental risks, and of course, for carbon pricing. Climate change was the focus of about three quarters of the work of the Ecofiscal Commission. The commission was funded with about $7.5 million over six years, not a penny of which came from any government. All was donated by nine family foundations and corporations. During the six years of its activity, the Ecofiscal Commission generated, and here comes a numbered list, so stay, pay attention, okay? 19 reports, beautifully written, 74 op-eds op or essays, 193 stakeholder briefings, 254 public presentations, most of which were done by me across the country, lots of travel, 355 blog columns, 9,600 media mentions, and over 2 million YouTube video views. All of that stuff, by the way, is still live and observable, accessible at ecofiscal.ca. Now, how about the commission's impact? Now, it's always extremely hard to establish a line of causality from an idea or a report or a conversation to a change, an actual change in policy. But we like to think that we improved the public debate about pollution pricing and helped several governments see their way to adopting these policies over the past decade. Now, as you well know, carbon pricing is back in the news in a big way, and so this debate is certainly not over. Uh, and even though the Ecofiscal Commission is no longer active, the website, as I said, is still live. Our reports continue to be cited, and the ideas continue to live on, at least for a while. In December of 2019, as the Commission wound up its operations, we had $750,000 left over. The donors signed the money over to the Max Bell School uh, with the commitment that we finance use that money to finance a series of 10 annual conferences on issues at the intersection of the economy and the environment. And so here we are. Um, this is the second, of, uh, second installment of that 10-year series. Um, and I'm very happy to be in Toronto, very nice digs here, and very happy to be partnering with TELUS and Walrus. And I hope this all works out well, and then we can talk about doing this every year for the next 10 years. Now, the theme of today's conference is unexpected climate connections, a focus on three policy areas that are not the usual suspects when we talk about climate policy. But these areas are connected to climate policy, even though they don't usually get top billing. So the three topic areas we have for you today are, number one, digital connectivity as climate policy, number two, indigenous economic development as climate policy, and number three, housing affordability as climate policy. For each of these topics, we've assembled a great collection of people to discuss the issues. Hopefully there will be a little bit of disagreement, lots of time for Q&A from the audience. Uh, and then we're gonna end the day uh, with a juicy policy debate on whether Canada needs to have a green industrial policy or, or whether you know, to achieve our climate goals or whether we can do it in a less intrusive way. Um, so let's get started with panel number one. I'm gonna ask the moderator and the panelists to come up to the stage. I'm gonna introduce the moderator and the moderator is gonna introduce, um, in, introduce his panelists. So as I said, the first panel is on digital connectivity. So improved connectivity has the potential to empower emissions reductions and support climate resilience in agriculture and natural resources, in electricity grids, 
homes, and buildings. In addition, as climate-related disasters become more frequent, digital connectivity has become the essential service driving emergency responses, community mobilization, and recovery. Do our current climate policies produce the right economic and market-based incentives to generate these connectivity improvements, or do we need additional policies to get there? Those are the kinds of issues that are going to be talked about for the next uh, hour or so. Now, our moderator for this panel is the one and only Matthew Mendelssohn, who is now the head of Social Capital Partners, which is driven by the concerns about how wealth concentration poses risks for Canada's economy and its democratic structures. He has boatloads of experience in policymaking in Canada, serving as DM in the Ontario and Canadian governments. Uh, there's some other things that I've missed that are in his bio, but I will point out that during his youth, which is not over yet, but during his youth, he was also a professor of politics and public policy at Queen's and Toronto Metropolitan University. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Matthew, and he's going to take it from there. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Is this, this seems to be working. It Thank you, working. Chris. Excellent. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I, good morning. Uh, I'm super excited to be here, and I say this uh, very sincerely. Uh, the Walrus is my favorite uh, Canadian uh, magazine. The Max Bell School is my favorite Canadian public policy school. And TELUS is by far my favorite telco. So uh, when, when I was asked to do this, I could not say no. And I did not know about this building. But this may be one of my favorite buildings now in, uh, in Toronto. It's really lovely to be here. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, uh, I'll, I'll tell a short story. Uh, and uh, it highlights another reason why I've, I've agreed to do this, which is that uh, I think that the uh, the, the principles of this conference are so important. So early in 2016, I was working for the federal government, and part of my job was to help the government achieve its uh, mandate in ways that improved outcomes on a whole bunch of things, one of which was climate and climate targets. Uh, and I'm sure most people are aware of this, uh, and I was aware of it at the time, but there was a very specific conversation where the Minister of Climate Change and the Environment, who had the title climate change uh, in, her, um, in her title, she and I are engaged in a conversation about how to achieve outcomes uh, on the climate change file. And it became very clear that almost every key tool or lever that the government had to make progress on climate change was not in her mandate. And it was not and it did not live in the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Climate Change. Um, and so all of these big things that matter to governments, that matter to citizens, almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them require collaboration, working across ministries, aligning tools, aligning levers. And as we also know, for those who've worked in government, ministries and departments often have their own incentives. And they have their own outcomes that they're trying to achieve. Uh, and while they might, in principle, care about what's going on elsewhere in government and hope that it succeeds, that isn't really their incentive structure. So it is a huge challenge for government uh, to achieve ambitious uh, goals and improve outcomes on things that cross a number of different departments and ministries. So this conversation, I think, is so interesting because clearly Canada has ambitious connectivity goals, um, and we clearly have climate goals, and how we link those, and then throughout the day some other issues as well, um, how we can drive those through uh, uh, complex government decision-making processes to make, uh, to make real change. So I'm really looking forward to finding out uh, how we can do that. Um, and really looking forward to finding out how we can connect these conversations. And we have the right people to do it. So uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, um, uh, with us today, uh, Anna Kanduth, uh, who is director of 440 Megatons at the Canadian uh, Climate Institute, Sangeeta Lali, who's the public policy director at TELUS Agriculture and Consumer Goods, and Scott Ross, who is the executive director of uh, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture. So, just by way of kind of introducing this conversation and allowing people 
to kind of deliver their first kind of main message. I'm going to ask each of you, and I guess I'll just go down and I'll start uh, with Sangeeta, from your perspective, what is the intersection between digital policy and climate policy? Are there things that people in this room will be surprised by? Are there things that you have found particularly surprising or compelling uh, as you have uh, gotten into this work? Well, digital policies enable digitization in our society. Uh, and digitization is enabled by strong connectivity that allows digital technologies to actually function, um, particularly if they're uh, connected by, uh, by wireless connectivity. I, I think one of, the, uh, one of the things that people don't always connect um, by themselves is, the, is that simple fact that you need internet and you need uh, wireless connectivity to enable digital technologies. And I think the reason that that happens is because so many of us live in urban areas. We have easy access to internet. If our Wi-Fi is not working, data picks up the slack and continues on for us. And so that interconnection just gets lost. But whenever I speak to any of my rural stakeholders, they get it immediately, um, particularly on the agriculture side, uh, because so many of them uh, don't have as accessible uh, access to connectivity um, as urban communities do. Uh, the intersection with uh, climate policy um, comes from various reports that have suggested that 20% of emissions can be reduced by digitization, and Jen pointed to that earlier as well. Um, and so I think this, this is one of the conversations that uh, we really should dive into today to see you know, how can we actually leverage digital policies to help reach that 20% reduction in emissions. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Sangeeta. And if people haven't read uh, TELUS's paper on this and the connection between uh, digital policy and climate policy, I would recommend it to people. I think it's uh, a really good uh, outline of a lot of these issues. And you have done uh, an excellent segue um, in terms of uh, the connection in rural communities, but also specifically perhaps uh, agricultural communities. So I will turn it over to you, Scott. Just in general, how do you approach uh, the issue of the connections between digital and climate policy? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll touch on a couple of fr fronts here. I think first from a very specific agricultural perspective and then touch on rural more generally, I think, as well. Um, in agriculture, the connection between climate policy and digital policy is very evident, and it centers around technology adoption. A lot of the opportunities in agriculture to really reduce our environmental footprint are centered around digital technologies, uh, largely under the banner of precision agriculture, which is a, is a whole ecosystem of technologies that center around field level sensors that allow you to be much more precise and targeted in application of uh, farm inputs like fertilizers, pesticides, limit your fuel use, and really inform your overall farm management practices in a way that uh, is only enabled through really data-driven solutions. And so at the real center of it, when we look at agriculture today, um, often the discussion centers around um, small-scale versus large-scale agriculture, industrial versus uh, what is often called agroecological practices. But at, really at the heart of where we are today and what's possible in the near future to help us achieve a lot of our aspirational climate targets is very much working with the systems we have in place. And there are immense technology offerings in agriculture, but connectivity is a real fundamental constraint for a lot of farmers. Um, whether it's a lack of connectivity writ large, a lack of cell service in your field, reliance on wireless internet that in many respects doesn't provide the bandwidth and the capacity to really meet the terabytes of information that actually move through some of these pieces of equipment. Um, there's a lot of capital intensive investments required to leverage a lot of this technology and, and it's very challenging to make those investments when you don't have certainty about your ability to actually fully maximize the ecosystem of services like AI and machine learning that make these technologies as impactful as they can be. I think the other connection in climate is more about managing climate risk and digital connectivity does play a really critical role in managing emergency situations as well. So you look at things like the atmospheric river flooding events in BC, there's a real time issue of movement uh, logistics around moving animals, keeping animal welfare considerations front and center, making sure we're minimizing and mitigating damage to our food systems. And that has to happen in a very urgent real time uh, capacity. When people are stressed, farmers are stressed, there's a lot going on, a lot of moving parts, and so there's a really fundamental importance of having digital connectivity to help manage the coordination and logistics involved in that. Uh, the last one, and I think the most surprising or that's not often considered, is the link between uh, 
Digital connectivity's role in quality of life in rural communities and what that means for climate. One of the biggest issues agriculture faces, and we're not unique in this, especially in the current labor market, is uh, major chronic labor constraints. We've had labor shortages for decades. They're forecasted to increase for decades to come. And the reality of that is farmers leave a lot on the table. And when we talk about what's being left on the table, it's opportunities to add value. And when we look at where markets are turning and the need for sustainably produced food products, a lot of that value add centers around climate practices. And so when there's shortages in people, uh, human ca capital, the end result of that is farmers do what they have to, have to do to get food produced, uh, and they leave some of those opportunities on the table. So I think uh, digital connectivity plays such a fundamental role in talent attraction and retention in rural communities where access to Netflix for a family is critical, but it also touches on social infrastructure like access to healthcare services, um, really innovative solutions in childcare provision and the like. All of this centers around having access to reliable digital connectivity and, and has implications for climate at the, at the back end of it as well. So it really touches on our sector in, in every possible facet. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Scott. Uh, over the last couple of years, I've learned uh, quite a bit more about precision agriculture and how uh, digital technology and uh, is being used uh, in agriculture and the importance in rural communities generally. And I just wanted to uh, say that, you know, from a personal perspective, I think the public conversation about what's going on uh, with precision agriculture and digital technology in, in farms uh, is not uh, attracting the attention that it should. It's great to listen to you speak about these issues. Um, I'm sure people here are all smarter and better informed than I am, so uh, maybe most people here knew all of that, but a couple of years ago I would not have known a lot of the things that you've just been talking about, and there may be some people here as well. So I just think it's it's an, it's unfortunate that those kinds of issues uh, do not get the uh, mainstream attention in media and elsewhere in Canada and that many um, uh, many people are not aware of what the, the enormous transformation that's going on digitally enabled uh, uh, in agricultural communities. Um, uh, so, uh, um, Anna, over to you for the same question. Sure, thanks. Um, I think this word is going to come up a lot today, but I'm going to agree with Sangeeta to say that digital policy and digital solutions are really important enablers of climate action. Uh, I think they can inform climate action by giving governments really high quality information about climate impacts, but also emissions. Uh, they can al also help deliver on climate objectives, both with respect to resilience and mitigation, and I'm sure we'll get into that uh, in great detail today. Uh, and they can also help track progress on climate progress. Um, but in my view, I think there's a pretty clear hierarchy here, and we can disagree about this perhaps, um, where I think digital policy and digital solutions uh, are a complement to climate policy, but they're not a substitute. So in my view, climate policy reigns supreme here. Uh, and perhaps something surprising, not for the panelists maybe, but uh, surprising to me is that uh, digital solutions are already having a really important um, impact across all sectors of the Canadian economy when it comes to resilience, when it comes to mitigation in transportation, in buildings, in agriculture, uh, in industry, and in electricity. So these aren't solutions that are on the horizon. Uh, they're here today, they're growing. And I think that growth presents a lot of really interesting opportunities, uh, but it also presents some interesting challenges, which we'll get into. Uh, thank you very much. And I think that's, you know, a key element of this discussion. Uh, you know, my introduction um, talked a little bit about the interconnection between some issues and how different departments have different mandates and all have their own goals, the, there are results that they're trying to achieve. Uh, and uh, as people here would know, if you're trying to achieve everything, uh, if you have 18 goals uh, in a policy area, if you have, you know, we're going to do infrastructure investments, but we're going to drive them through 12 or 15 different lenses around inclusion or climate or accessibility, it makes it very difficult to make decisions. Uh, and I think it's useful that you clearly have put on the table, because I think we probably want some disagreement amongst this panel, uh, that the climate goal should be uh, primary, uh, that uh, other elements should be supportive uh, and enabling, uh, but the primary objective has to be the climate, uh, the climate objective, and we'll see uh, how that, that conversation unfolds. Um, so, uh, Sangeeta, let me ask you, um, you know, in your experience, 
uh, and you've worked in, I mean, you work at TELUS Agriculture, so you have some agriculture back background, digital connectivity, and obviously climate uh, is important here. Uh, do you find that these conversations are integrated, the connectivity conversation and the climate uh, conversation? No, I, I, don't, I don't think that they are. Uh, I mean, we have a, a few key proof points on this. Uh, in, in not a single G7 country, including in Canada, uh, are digital policies included uh, as a solution for climate policies? You know, by, within Canada itself, um, we've seen uh, government departments across the board come up with targets on emissions that they want to reduce, but never really having that discussion of how they're actually going to achieve those targets. Uh, agriculture is a great example. I, a few years ago, the Agriculture Canada announced that they wanted a target to reduce uh, fertilizer emissions by 30%. But without having that discussion with industry and without having the discussion about how they were actually going to achieve that target, industry rightfully was very angry uh, and spoke out against it uh, quite a bit and continued to do so. Um, I think the discussion of how is very important when setting, setting up climate targets so that we can determine how we're actually going to achieve that target. Uh, and what, what do you think are some of the obstacles to uh, integrating those conversations? And I think one is just the recognition that uh, digitization and digital technologies play such a significant role in reducing emissions and really understanding how that works. Um, so when it comes to connectivity, uh, I, I don't think that ICED or CRT, CRTC fully understands the, the impacts and the implications of their policy and decision making on how infrastructure gets built out in the country. And if infrastructure isn't being built out quickly in the country, people in rural communities aren't getting connected as, as quickly and they're not able to fully leverage digital technologies to reduce their emissions. Um, the same goes with spectrum policy. You know, spectrum policies in Canada right now uh, aren't designed to move spectrum uh, quickly into the hands of telcos, and once they are into the hands of telcos, spectrum is just very capital intensive, uh, and so there isn't there aren't the money and the funds to quickly turn that spectrum into uh, into connectivity through building infrastructure out. Um, so I, I don't. I we probably don't want to get into a really wonky. Well, this is already wonky, but uh, you know, gov <laughs> governance uh, discussion, but. The, um, uh, I just wanted to say that I, I agree with your uh, perspective. If I think about uh, ICED-driven discussions around connectivity targets um, and uh, the, the building uh, funds and rolling out internet, and then I think about uh, the conversations around climate goals and resilience and adaptation, but uh, reducing GHGs, uh, those conversations largely take place uh, with different incentive structures amongst different people in different rooms uh, with with quite different goals. And it's really hard to integrate. And, and, it's, and it's not just I said. You know, I don't think uh, officials at Environment Canada fully recognize the impact that uh, connectivity would end up having on reducing emissions. So I think all of the discussions in government are just, they're so siloed by department that if we were able to get departments to integrate their discussions a little bit more closely, that we might be able to see a faster progression on digital policy as a part of climate policy. I mean, I think it's uh, striking that you say that in the G7 countries, none, none in their climate plans have digital uh, solutions or talk about uh, connectivity, because I think for most people, it's intuitive. Uh, it would be intuitive uh, that if we're talking about work from home, you need connectivity, which presumably reduces commute time, et cetera. And I haven't done the modeling, but it should seem intuitive to people. Yeah, and it's an opportunity for governments around the world uh, to really take a leadership role uh, as they integrate digital policies into the climate policy. So, I mean, in Canada in particular, we... Um, we have a uh, great infrastructure across the country that we can be leveraging to improve and increase digitization of technologies. Um, but there are these gaps that we need to fill. And so if we can start having these discussions on how we leverage digital policy as a part of climate policy, we can start taking the actions that we need to take to improve 
access to digital technologies uh, so that we can further reduce our emissions and try to hit that 20% reduction uh, that reports have suggested that we can do as a country. Uh, thank you, Sangeeta. Um, Scott, you know, I, I, I like your explanation and your introduction, and I think I get how digital technology and connectivity can accelerate the adoption of emission-reducing technology and uh, practices. Um, what, from your perspective, are uh, key other policy measures that are necessary to make this adoption uh, evolution happen in a way that, you know, drives better outcomes for the climate? Yeah, I think, so, you know, centering around the space around digital uh, connectivity or digital policy at large, maybe outside of the connectivity space, I think the other really critical piece in agriculture has been um, data governance is a real issue that constrains a lot of advances. Uh, one of the issues we face all the time is that it's very hard to communicate what's happening on farms um, from a data-driven perspective because farmers, and, and Sangeeta touched on this as well, um, there's a lack of trust with government about sharing information. There's no question in the agriculture sector that that is a concern. And I think one of the areas that really does require a lot of focus um, in particular is around looking at the digital charter that's being discussed, looking at what are the protections and privacy considerations that need to be looked at specifically in agriculture. Because one of the realities with farming is your home and your business are often located in the same place. And geographic identifiers on data can be a real um, point of concern and certainly leads to a lot of farmers being very reluctant to share information. So I think this is really a big P policy discussion. It's not just a governmental policy issue, but there has to be a, a much more concerted effort to really square away and create standardization and codes of practice in our sector that give people the confidence and the platforms to share information in a way where they feel like they're, they're benefiting from the data they're sharing and it's also being sufficiently protected. And, and at the heart of that as well is I think being able to tell our story, very few people understand the history of agriculture in Canada. From a productivity standpoint, we have been rock stars in the Canadian economy that have really, over 50 years, outpaced pretty much any other sector in our economy in terms of productivity growth. And so we're now producing twice as much food with the same emissions uh, we were 20 years ago. And I think uh, we are challenged by absolute emissions targets, there's no question. But when you're an actual farmer on the ground, the reality of reducing your emissions is about reducing the intensity of your production. I think there's no sense that we are looking to reduce the amount of food we're producing in Canada because there are competing policy imperatives here. Um, but I think there's also another element to this that is the intersection between Canada's domestic policy and global policy in this space. And I think there is a missed opportunity often in our domestic policy discussions around uh, what are the impacts of uh, the policy decisions made on Canada and our ability to provide food for the world? Because often what happens is if you drive the cost up of producing food in a jurisdiction like Canada, um, who operate in global markets, the net impact can be that those with a much higher emissions intensity are, are displacing our exports. And so uh, making sure you're also maintaining that global lens on things and that it's being informed by data-driven approaches really does center around being able to collect farm level data and in, in a way that we have not been to date. And, and some of the challenges Sangeeta spoke with uh, too about that fertilizer emissions target also centers around the fact that most farmers when they look at the way emissions are reported relative to what's happening on their farm, there's a very immediate understanding that they're missing a lot of the picture. Uh, the data we track for the National Inventory Report in Canada just, just does not have the ability to capture the complex ecosystems and all that's happening on farms. And so we need to get to a place where farmers are incentivized to share their information in a way where they see value, but it's also helping inform public policy. Uh, can I push you on a couple of those, those pieces for uh, you know, crunchy examples uh, and, and also a bit of an update? So I, I'm curious about the, de uh, the, the data governance conversation and where you think that's at. Um, and whether progress is being made, and I'm not sure if you have insight uh, there, I don't want to put you on the spot, uh, but that seems important. And second, can you talk a bit more about, uh, you know, that reluctance to share data, and I understand, uh, you know, the geolocation piece, and um, can you, you, could you explain, I don't know, what that means or feels like or what the specific concerns are um, or how data could be used. Um, I'd, I'd just be curious to hear more about that. 
Yeah, so on, on the first point, I think there is a lot of good work going on at ISED and other departments looking into digital privacy and protection. I, I will say, I think, and this is not unique to that department, but there's a sense from our sector that we're not really being actively engaged in the conversation early enough. I think that's a, a sort of a trope you'll hear a lot from agriculture in general is that there's a sense that we are very well engaged with the agriculture and agri-food Canada, that department and government, but there's a growing sense that as, as these policies advance, as, as the policy directives are being given to other departments that we have to have a much more fulsome early conversation to make sure that farm considerations are being given due attention. So while I think there's a lot of good work underway looking at how we can standardize, I mean, I sit on a number of different groups with the Canadian Standards Association looking at agri-food data, trying to develop standards, looking at what's needed in that space, but ultimately um, from a more sort of whole of government departmental standpoint, um, there is a sense that uh, I don't think the, the unique realities around farming are really being considered as a standalone economic sector. We're being treated much like other businesses, and I do think there's a concern that there will be uh, gaps in the sort of level of protection. I know when you look at the EU, for example, farm data is often treated very similar to pr personal data. They have similar standards of protection, and I think there is a, a real need in Canada to look at models that don't constrain the supply chain getting the information they need, but at the same time really do take a slightly different tact with uh, Canadian farms where it's 200,000 small family farm businesses across our country and they have very unique uh, concerns in that space. I think with respect to the other question, um, there's a few elements at play. I think one is that farmers are, are understandably um, concerned that a lot of what is currently framed as targets with voluntary incentive-based approaches um, could if progress is not sufficient in our sector to come near the targets that have been set, that it'll, we'll be reverting to more mandatory regulated approaches. And I think for a lot of farmers, the concern is if I share my information five years down the road, how is that information going to be used? Is it going to be used with respect to the current sort of policy regime we're talking about, or is it going to be used um, from their perspective against me in some capacity where I'm going to be regulated based on what's been shared in that information? And so. Um, at the heart of it, I think we have tried to advance something called the Canadian Agri-Food Sustainability Initiative, which is a platform that farmers can go through where they answer a series of questions and it helps them put all of their sustainability information, not just environmental but social and other areas, in one place that helps them respond to all the competing different demands they face, whether that's buyers looking for certain practices, regulatory requirements, but in a manner that is, is farmer friendly, that is from a trusted provider that isn't residing with government, but is accessible. And I think it's in that space where we need to spend a lot more time. And I think this is a question not just for government, but industry as a whole also, I think, needs to take this more seriously. Digital policy, unfortunately, in agriculture has a tendency to fall down the list of priorities. And I think it's a shame because I think the intersection of climate and digital policy isn't fully appreciated um, at the grassroots either. And so keeping it at the front of policy dialogues is a real challenge. Uh, I'm going to follow up on that in, in one sec. I, I did just want to encourage people who are interested in having a positive impact on uh, their country and on their public policy environment to get involved in standards work. Uh, it isn't always the most uh, exciting uh, work, but uh, it is uh, the hidden DNA that drives positive or sometimes negative uh, outcomes. So uh, I'm, I'm very glad you're on those committees. Uh, I wanted to pick up on uh, another piece that you mentioned, which is about digital connectivity's policy not being top of mind or top of priority list, uh, and just kind of ask you directly from your perspective, uh, and uh, you obviously don't speak for all farmers, or the, uh, but um, uh, would you prioritize digital policy or connectivity um, uh, more. Um, how does that rank compared to, you know, pro-competition measures or broad-based uh, royal rural deployment targets? Um, uh, where where would you situate this in in uh, the policy agenda? Well, I think the, it's a very timely conversation because I think the reaction to the targets that have been set for a sector, whether it's on nitrous oxide, on methane emissions, whatever that might be, um, the conversation in agriculture has shifted. And, and to be honest, you know, five years ago, if we were talking about climate change policy at our, our annual meeting, the questions would center around why we're doing this. And now it's very much focused on the how. And I think that is bringing this digital connectivity piece to the fore in a sense that it wasn't there before because um, 
you know, to your question about the hierarchy of different priority policy priorities, um, I don't think we view climate and digital policies as competing. It's this is a as it was said before, an enabler. This is the how of how we actually get to the targets that are being set in climate policy. And I think the frustration that Sangeeta referenced earlier stems from the fact that um, there's a growing sense that we don't know enough about what's happening on the, at the farm level to really make informed decisions in this space and that there's a commitment and a, a, an ongoing, I think, understanding in agriculture that the pressing priorities we face today, which are most, you know, as with many businesses, farmers are business owners first and they treat sustainability decisions in that manner, is about looking at their margins, looking at how they're going to remain profitable, how they're going to remain productive. Um, but the two come together very closely in agriculture because fuel, farm inputs, those are major expense lines for farmers. So there's a really tight intersection there that I think has to be front and center. I will say in the space around connectivity itself, I think spectrum policy, which Sangeeta spoke to earlier, is really vital. And I think the issue at the heart of it, and to not get too wonky in all of this, is that um, we need to be looking at connectivity in a much more granular scale. Often the way connectivity is mapped is there's one urban center in the, in the center of an area, a rural hinterland around that. And if that urban center is sufficiently connected, connected from my said standpoint, that region has connectivity. And it's that last mile piece that often gets lost in the equation, and that's really what's fundamental to making it work for farmers. And you know, moving forward, I think the shift is to field-level connectivity. A lot of these technologies require you to be able to have access in the middle of a 10,000-acre grain farm that your equipment is able to communicate on an ongoing real-time basis throughout. So I think there's a shift in emerging priorities, but it really does all center around at the heart of it. Um, making sure that we're setting the right connectivity targets and ensuring that we're uh, really taking the policies that we've seen adopted around use it or lose it with Spectrum and making sure that's being drilled down to a granular level that really does appreciate the diversity in a lot of regions that isn't otherwise really factored in right now the way those connectivity measures are targeted or measured. Uh, and I'll just, th that was very helpful and I, I learned a lot from that. Uh, and I just also would like to highlight the importance of spectrum policy, which again is an issue that lots of people don't have particular interest in or find quite uh, intimidating to engage with. But you know, in Canada, compared to other countries, uh, we don't release as much spectrum as quickly, and we charge a lot more to our telecommunications companies to, to purchase it, which creates obstacles to connectivity. Um, and how we measure connectivity, as you say, um, uh, does not always coincide with what is meaningful for someone on the ground. Um, and uh, I think those are, those are important issues to highlight. So like usual, any p policy conversation in Canada just gets dominated by agriculture. Um, uh, so I'd like to shift it a little bit um, and Anna, I'd like you to to kind of uh, weigh in now on this uh, in this conversation and share your perspectives on you know digital policy and particularly uh, emissions reductions. Um, but I know you have lots of ex experience with the electricity sector, um, so I, I would just be interested in your uh, your observations on uh, how digital policy can be used to reduce emissions in electricity or in other sectors? Yeah, I think electricity is a really great example for two reasons. The first is that we know it's at the heart of the net zero transition in Canada and globally. Uh, and second, because I think it's a sector that's really poised for digital disruption. Uh, we know that we're going to have increased reliance on electricity as Canada transitions to net zero, uh, and that as we electrify more, our electricity systems are going to have to become bigger, cleaner, and smarter. Uh, and I think that bigger and the cleaner piece is pretty obvious. Uh, when we talk about smarter systems, we're talking about systems that are more flexible to enable increased integration of variable renewable energy and also to boost system resilience. Uh, and that flexibility requires a ton of digital solutions. Uh, so those digital solutions can help integrate more variable renewables by better matching uh, demand to when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. Uh, they can help uh, enable virtual power plants, decentralized energy resources, which we know are going to grow in importance uh, on the path to net zero. Uh, and they can 
also help system planners better plan and manage really complex electricity systems uh, by giving them more real-time data about supply and demand. Um, so that's on the supply side. I think on the demand side too for electricity, uh, we're seeing the emergence of a lot of smart technologies like um, smart thermostats, smart electric vehicle charging infrastructure, um, you know, other smart appliances in our homes that can be really important for demand side management, uh, which we know can of course uh, improve energy efficiency, which can reduce emissions, uh, but is also really important for enabling that flexibility in electricity systems that's going to be so critical as our electricity systems do become bigger and cleaner. Uh, that's that's very interesting, and I think people are uh, uh, starting to understand that connection more, um, particularly on the emissions reduction side. I'm wondering. I guess we've talked a little bit about it uh, with uh, with Sangita and Scott, but on the resilience side as well. Um, what is what is the connection between digital connectivity and resilience? Yeah, I think there are huge connections there as well. I think digital solutions can help um, inform our resilience by giving us better information about climate impacts and also improving our ability to adapt to them. Uh, so on the one hand, they can give us a lot better information um, and data by you know, informing our understanding of climate impacts at a much more local level. We know that's a huge barrier right now to climate resilience, understanding climate impacts at a local level. So for example, uh, more advanced weather monitoring and reporting can help better predict uh, and manage extreme weather events like floods, wildfires, heat waves, uh, and can help governments better prepare for, plan, and respond to those events, uh, including sending early warning signs to residents. Uh, and I think, too, a lot of the solutions that we think of as mitigation solutions can also act as resilient solutions. Uh, so I was talking about those smart thermostats. Uh, those smart thermostats can help monitor indoor air quality. Uh, they can help monitor indoor air temperatures, uh, which can really improve health outcomes uh, during wildfire season and during heat waves, which unfortunately we know are becoming uh, much more frequent and severe in Canada. Uh, and I think two more broadly, those smart grid solutions that I was talking about, uh, by enabling more flexible electricity systems, they can make those systems more resilient. So more flexible, more adaptable to be able to identify outages, fix them quickly, and keep those electricity systems going. And I think that's going to be especially critical as we see increased digitalization across the economy, because electricity systems, which are already critical infrastructure, are going to become increasingly critical as our reliance on electricity grows. Do you, you have a sense, let me kind of push a bit on that, uh, do you have a sense of um, you know, how, how quickly these technologies are being adopted at the consumer level, at the industry level? I think it's going, it's going, but it's going slower. And I think one of the key barriers there is awareness. I think, you know, a lot of these technologies, you know, some of them are emerging, some of them are already here, but I think consumers and businesses and industries don't necessarily understand the benefits of them. And going back to Scott's point about, you know, data privacy and security, I think there's also reluctance on the part of consumers um, and industries to, you know, let the governments into their homes if they don't feel like their data is being protected uh, and that it's secure. Here. So I think you know these technologies are here, and you know they can be deployed much faster. But there are still some barriers preventing that acceleration. Uh, I did not expect when I woke up this morning that most of the panelists would talk about data security and the digital charter uh, in this uh, in this panel, both of which I've been involved with at various times. Uh, so that's 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 nice. Um, let me uh, ask all of you kind of uh, a question, and it might be a bit counterintuitive. Uh, as, I, as I said at the beginning, it seems obvious to people when you point out, uh, you know, digital connectivity enables certain uh, less carbon intensive activities, um, and so the connection is clear. Uh, but what about the reverse? Um, what are some of the digital or connectivity issues that could have downsides uh, on climate. Uh, the, the people who do this work, and maybe Chris and the eco-fiscal system would you know, talk about first order, second order, third order uh, climate impacts um, and uh, trying to estimate uh, those. Um, and so I'm just wondering, uh, and I'll start with you, Sangeeta, whether there are issues that you have concerns with about the digital policy 
space and its impact on climate and how one, you think, should, should deal with those. Actually, if you don't mind, I want to just take a second in response to, or to just add on of to course. what Anna was just saying. 100%, um, On Sorry. resilience and mitigation. I mean, if we're going to use these digital tools uh, to support during times of fire or floods or hurricanes or what have you, uh, when it comes to natural disasters, we also need to make sure that we're protecting critical infrastructure during such fires, floods, and hurricanes. Um, I think TELUS spent well over $140 million last year in protecting our, our network and our infrastructure uh, during wildfire season. And uh, this is becoming more and more of a challenge as more natural disasters are hitting uh, every year. Uh, and so we need to figure out ways to ensure that that critical infrastructure stays in place uh, so that um, so that first responders can respond, so that these technologies can continue working, so that businesses who rely on these technologies for their businesses, if we're going to encourage them to use them, continue working during a time of crisis uh, and don't just completely collapse. Um, and that's where I think uh, it's important for municipal, uh, provincial, and federal governments to work together to ensure that they are able to continue supporting, um, supporting such critical infrastructure uh, yeah, during, and during difficult times. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, and, and sorry, yeah. that, that was a point. But I can go on to answer your actual question if you would like. I, before you do, I just wanted to ag uh, agree with you. And uh, you know, when we think about the protection of critical infrastructure, we sometimes forget about telecommunications infrastructure. There are a variety of adaptation, resilience, um, uh, um, disaster mitigation programs that kind of I think overlook telecommunications infrastructure, and I think that's a problem. Uh, so just wanted to uh, add my support there, but um, to, to the question. All right, back to the question then. Uh, so digital technologies, uh, you know, connectivity, they, they do produce emissions. I won't sit here and tell you that they don't. They do produce emissions, however, um, when they are applied and when they are used, they do reduce the overall emissions that are emitted. Um, I will use, we'll use me as an example. If I joined this panel today virtually from where I live in Calgary, I would have still used emissions, heating my home, keeping the lights on, using my laptop. However, I would have used significantly less emissions than taking a plane over, taking an Uber to the airport, and then taking, uh, taking a cab from the airport to my hotel. Um, so the overall emissions that would overall emissions would be reduced if technology is applied. I think one of the things we need to start looking at, though, is you know we need to start moving towards the positive outcomes that we would get through digitization, and assess the negatives uh, that might come out of digitization, such as emissions that could get produced, and figure out how we can reduce them further. Uh, one of the things that Telus has been doing over the last uh, the last few years is converting our uh, network infrastructure from copper to fiber optic cables. Uh, this has allowed us to make our network stronger so that our customers are able to get better and more uh, consistent access to connectivity. Um, but it's also helped us to uh, improve, our, uh, improve our energy efficiency by 85%. And it's allowing us to transition our uh, massive central offices that are used to store this copper infrastructure uh, to turn them from these energy uh, intensive buildings to energy efficient homes uh, for people to live in. Uh, so there are ways that we can you know, transition over to, um, to continue reducing emissions uh, rather than doing, the things, uh, doing things the way we used to do them. Uh, I'll, I'll just ask Scott and uh, Anna the same question. I mean, these policy issues are complex. Uh, all of us are aware sometimes you try and deal with a one particular problem and design solutions, it produces problems elsewhere and unintended consequences. So this seems all very complex. Um, and uh, from your perspective, how do we make sure this conversation is not producing unintended consequences or that we're mitigating uh, uh, those? I think from an agricultural perspective, one of the critical pieces is making sure that we're taking very uh, outcome-based approaches in these policy areas. One of the realities in agriculture is we are an immensely diverse sector, not just in terms of what people are producing, but there's regional variations, there's scale dynamics. You have everything from a one-acre market garden to somebody who is farming 30,000 acres of grain in Western Canada. And the solutions digitally available to them are not going to be one and the same. And so I think one of the risks we always run in, whether it's in connectivity policy or anything else, is just not applying a one-size-fits-all lens to things and being too prescriptive. And this 
casts over to climate policy in areas like carbon offset protocols and the like is making sure that we're creating tools that are flexible enough to accommodate the diversity of our sector. When you talk about unintended consequences, I think some of the real-time considerations as a critical infrastructure, agriculture is very much growing its appreciation for cybersecurity. I think that is one area that um, Historically, we have not been a very mature sector in that space, and I do think as we're advancing in these areas that if the corresponding protections on cybersecurity and efforts aren't made to raise awareness and build more protections in that space, we are exposing ourselves to unintended risks and concerns. Um, and another example I just touched, and this maybe bleeds more over into more just traditional climate policy, is around uh, when we talk about electrification and electric vehicles, there's a lot of attention in that space, but I think in agriculture there's a worry sometimes that we're jumping over opportunities that are right in front of us. And so in agriculture, one of the really exciting developments is autonomous vehicles. And people don't really understand the climate implications of moving from a tractor or a combine that has a person driving it to pulling them off that vehicle. You can reduce their emissions load by 25% just by taking a person off a vehicle and making sure you're not having to cool that cab, do all the things to make it hospitable for a person to sit on what is a massive piece of equipment generating a lot of heat. Um, there's a huge emissions potential there. And if we're so focused solely on one prescriptive target like electrification, we, we run the risk of missing really vital opportunities that may be more uh, readily available and, and ready to move as a sector. Thank you, Scott. Anna? Yeah, I think one of the clear examples here where we see digital solutions uh, as a source of emissions um, is their energy intensity. We know that these digital solutions use a lot of energy, especially the data centers that underpin digitalization. Uh, and I think you know that source of emissions is often the carbon intensity of the local grid. So coming back to electricity, <clears throat> I'm becoming the electricity person today, but coming back to electricity, I think cleaning up the local grid can really help reduce the emissions intensity uh, of those energy intensity cent energy intensive centers. Um, but I think another solution that we need to think about is actually understanding the carbon footprint of these solutions. You know, we know that what gets measured gets managed, and I don't think we have a clear picture right now of what the carbon footprint of these solutions is, and that's going to become an increasing challenge as digitalization increases across the economy. Uh, we are seeing governments around the world starting to think about this. I think there's a bill in the U.S. right now that's looking at uh, measuring the emissions from artificial intelligence, but I think governments in Canada need to be thinking about that because this could be a huge blind spot uh, when it comes to meeting our climate targets. I think that's a really important point to highlight. Um, we're we're going to go to questions in, in a few minutes. I have a few more questions, but um, uh, I'm going to ask another question to all of you, and then uh, um, we'll turn it to the floor if there are any questions. And if not, I have other things that I wanted to, to probe. Um, so uh, this conversation has been great. I've, I've loved uh, talking to all of you and meeting uh, a couple of you, um, and this is great, and I'm sure everyone uh, has learned a lot, but kind of who is responsible for this? How do we move forward on this? Like, so we've highlighted these connections, but um, you know, what is the first thing government should do? What is, uh, what are some of the actions that the private sector should do? Let's. Assume that everyone uh, you know, recognizes these connections and have learned some things from this panel. You know, what do we do with this now in terms of a governing agenda, in terms of uh, business activities? Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Sangeeta. Well, I, I do think everybody has a role to play in this. <laughs> um, when it comes to government, uh, I think one of the things that they should do uh, as soon as they can, is, is set up a climate impact assessment on every single policy that they create and have that be an action that gets taken uh, across all departments. Uh, this is a way that they can be measuring, you know, pre-measuring emissions that can be reduced with policies that they create uh, and emissions that can be avoided as well. When it comes to the tech sector, uh, they should be building technologies that actually work for their customers. One of the reasons that Amazon is so successful is because they have kept their customers in mind from the very beginning. Uh, when I speak with farmers, some of them tell me that the technologies that are being introduced to them are useless because nobody bothered to talk to a farmer on how the technology would actually be used. Um, so I think that's something that technology providers need to do is make sure that they talk to their uh, talk to their customers. When it comes to the telco sector, we need to continue innovating in the telecom space so that we can find solutions that are uh, that are uh, 
cheaper for us to put out, um, such as leveraging satellite in rural communities uh, so that we can get rural Canadians connected even faster. Um, you know, we've been testing out technologies on satellite and trying to determine whether we can use satellite technology to provide support to ag IoT uh, so that technologies can be used on farm. Um, so I think that there are all of these different actions that you know, government can be taking, industry can be taking to apply digital technologies uh, and digitization in our communities. Thank you, Singita. Scott. Yeah, I think I would agree very much that everyone has a part to play in this. I think in many respects, um, you know, outside of the reference I made earlier to the government's connectivity policy and, and the priority about making sure we're getting a little more um, granular on, on rural connectivity, I think government has a play, it has a real fundamental role as an enabler here. And whether that is creating a climate uh, from a policy perspective that really uh, supports the private sector to move forward with creating the standards um, interoperability in ecosystems to really leverage AI and machine learning technologies um, and creates the incentive structure to basically help the private sector um, move forward in those areas where there is a real need, but there's a sense of uh, need for independence from government, like I said, around who's holding data for farmers and the like. So I think their government doesn't have to be the one doing all of this, but I think they need to be sending the right signals and incentives to help people move forward in that space. And at the same time, I think we as an industry, uh, in agriculture in particular, need to do a better job of being more uh, clear and specific about what our priorities are in those spaces, where from a connectivity standpoint is the urgent need, because there is a question of everyone wants affordable uh, comp competition in terms of providers and universal connectivity, and they want it all at the same time. And I don't think that gives government a very clear signal about where to spend resources and time and energy. And so I think ultimately it's, it's a shared responsibility, but we in Canada certainly can do more to develop things like codes of practice at an industry level that haven't been done to date. And I think that there's a role government can play to facilitate that, but it does ultimately fall on the sector to be uh, responsible to move that forward and, and understand the priority there and, and act on that. I mean, I, I do think that's uh, a really important point that a lot of this uh, that both of you have said uh, can be driven by sectors and businesses themselves and not waiting for government to act. And on a lot of these issues, government is, I'd say, overwhelmed and doesn't necessarily have great capacity, uh, as Sangeeta said, often not talking properly to people uh, on the ground. So in the agriculture sector or elsewhere, developing own approaches, own standards, co-created within the sector um, by industry associations. I mean, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Anna. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things that governments could do, but not to overwhelm them further. Maybe I'll focus on two and just want to double down on a couple of things we've already talked about. I think the first thing that governments should be focusing on is addressing those market failures. So ensuring equitable, accessible, affordable, high quality internet uh, in places that the private sector won't. So those rural and remote communities that don't have equitable access right now. And I think that's going to be really critical to ensuring access to these solutions that can reduce emissions, that can enhance resilience, uh, but can also lower costs. So there's an affordability piece here as well. Uh, and I'd say the second piece, again, coming back to that data availability, we know that in order for these digital solutions to work effectively, they're going to have to be based on high quality, reliable, transparent data. Uh, so I think governments have a role to play in enabling that access to data uh, in bringing in standards for that data. Uh, and also, again, coming back to privacy and security. I think until we have that trust between governments and end users that their data is secure and that it's private and protected, uh, I think there's still going to be a reluctance to adopt these technologies in a really big way. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm going to turn it to the floor now. Are there any questions? I'm just looking. Oh, we have people walking to the microphone, both, both of whom I know. So I can actually say their names. Ken, I will start with you. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, so I moved to rural Alberta in June of 2020 and uh, asked what my internet options were. And I got six megabit per second satellite internet for about 120 bucks. A year later, that moved to 12 megabit. Then Telus came in, put in a tower. I had to change my service from Rogers to Telus to use the tower. And then I heard about this thing called Starlink. And I now get more reliable, faster internet service in rural Alberta than I do in my Toronto condo. And uh, Starlink is now saying I can put a Starlink disk or some version of it on a tractor, on a combine, or in my car. 
And so my question is, is Starlink the, the Uber or the Airbnb of internet? Are they just gonna displace all of these things? Like I worked on, on uh, spectrum auctions in the early Harper years, and I know a lot about how that all works and how it doesn't work. But it seems to me it's irrelevant if, if we have the satellite internet options. And a lot of the things like the rural satellites, I live in a little tiny community in rural Alberta, and there used to be four people that were, lived there full time and worked, and there's now 25 or 30. So it seems to me it's part of the solution to the housing crisis. But there's no regulation as far as I can tell on what, on what Starlink is doing. Is like, is this gonna blow everything out of the water and just solve all their problems, or am I missing something? Um, I, I think, uh, I mean, Anna may have something to say about that, but I think Scott and Sangeeta both will have something to say about that. So uh, why don't I start, start with you, Scott? Yeah, I think so. We've certainly watched the development of Starlink very closely and have been monitoring sort of the development that's happened there. I mean, as it stands today, there are pockets of the country that still don't have access to that kind of technology, but that's not to say that that won't be coming in due time. I think there's more and more satellites going up all the time. I think when we talk to farmers on the ground, the biggest concern they have is being captive to one provider. And at the end of the day, even if there is a very functioning provider from a satellite technology perspective, there are concerns that affordability, service standards, all of those will diminish over time if there's not a competitive environment. And so I think that's our primary concern is certainly it's part of the toolkit and it's something we're really excited about. But at the same time, um, there's a real sense that we cannot let um, rural Canada be treated as, as a sole provider where there's not the same sense of competition that we have in urban centers. And, and farmers do very acutely feel, and I, I won't speak for all of them, but we hear it regularly, certainly, that um, they don't want to be treated as second-class citizens when it comes to digital connectivity. And yes, satellite technology is um, very accessible, but there are affordability questions still, and certainly, I think, just a, a concern around the competitive environment moving forward. I think I, I agree with you. I think satellite is uh, is a part of the toolbox for for rural connectivity and providing solutions. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that Telus has been partnering with satellite providers uh, in testing out egg IoT products and whether they will work with satellite, uh, as well as testing out cell phones with satellite uh, to make uh, to improve cell phone coverage in rural and remote areas as well. Uh, thank you, um, Tom. Hi, folks. Um, you're all my friends, I like you all very much. Uh, but I'm gonna throw out maybe two uh, challenging questions. Uh, so the first one is, um, we are facing an environment where business and the business sector and the private sector is increasingly viewed with skepticism and to some degree uh, for good cause. But what happens when you've, like how do we solve for um, that skepticism that is being driven by some bad actors and how do we separate the wheat from the chaff to enable and make visible companies that are doing the right thing and that are advancing solutions. So that's question one. And question two, because I'm going to steal the power of the microphone while I've got it. Um, politically, we're talking about government and policy here. Politically, um, we are skating towards if the po current polls are to be believed, there's a decent chance of a change in government at some point in the next 18 months or so. Um, and that, you know, the conservatives have a different orientation. How do we think about um, climate and economic policy uh, and digital policy in the light of maybe a different political uh, mindset in power? Uh, good questions. Who wants to start with either of them? I mean, I can start. Um, Excellent. Thank you, Sangeeta. Uh, when it comes to climate policy, I think even the conservatives are going to have to have a strategy and well aware they are working on one, too. Um, it's not an issue that I think can be ignored, given the discussions of climate policy that are happening on the international stage, um, but also domestically here in Canada. I think Canadians have communicated that it is an important issue for them, uh, them personally. And we do see that also in public opinion polls in terms of what issues are important to people. Um, so I, I do think that if the Conservatives do win the next election, I do think that they would have some sort of climate policy to be a part of it. Um, I think one of the discussions that we all should be having with all elected officials is how can climate policy also be an economic policy? And that's where I think digital policy comes in. Uh, digital policy 
uh, encourages innovation, it encourages new ideas uh, to help reduce emissions. And this can help spur a green, um, this can help continue the, the green tech industry that's, that's starting up in Canada. Um, so there are solutions to this problem that aren't necessarily going to be a cost to Canadians or businesses, but can also help to enable growth for businesses. Thank you. Anna? Yeah, I'll agree with that. I think it's a framing issue. I think we need to be framing these not as, you know, purely environmental challenges, but thinking about ensuring the competitiveness of existing industries by acting on climate and also creating opportunities for emerging industries by, you know, advancing these solutions, most of which are digital solutions. So I think it's a framing issue. And I agree. I think all governments across Canada have to have, you know, credible climate plans because the public opinion polls are just pointing in that direction. Yeah, and I would, I mean, I agree very much with the point about framing. I think, um, so I, I'm the co-chair of an advisory committee to develop something called the Sustainable Agriculture Strategy, which is a 25-year vision for what agriculture, a sustainable agriculture sector looks like to 2050. And I think the intention behind that is to try to build um, a policy platform that better links the economic and environmental considerations involved in adopting best management practices and the like that in a way that will help survive political cycles. I mean, obviously, that's a bit of an idyllic, uh, idyllic uh, expectation. But at the heart of it, I think farmers um, are very aware of that skepticism around the sector. I think they're frustrated by it in many respects. And, and I think from their perspective, uh, the solution stems from from data is let's have an apples to apples discussion about what's actually happening on farming, what has happened, where we're heading um, versus what is often a very rhetorical exercise in the media. And I think more often than not, the solution is about making sure we have the data to speak to the realities that are happening on farms. and in a fashion that allows for that conjoined discussion around what it means economically, because farmers are generally operating in global markets. They're competing with others in other, uh, other jurisdictions that are not held to the same standards. And there are real world implications if our, our domestic policies on climate cause a loss of competitiveness in terms of not just what it means for the domestic food supply, but the emissions re related to food production and agricultural production around the world as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, one more question, and then if there are any questions online, you can throw me out one, but first over here. So to the previous um, question around what can we do to support companies, Foresight Canada does really great work in supporting emerging companies, and so I'm the Director of Business Development at Raingrid, and we're a globally recognized climate adaptation technology that works at the property scale, recognized by the World Economic Forum, recognized at COP28. We go to DC to sell, that's where I just came back from, but the traction in Canada is so slow. The water sector is very risk averse and there's very little support for homegrown Canadian companies that are doing the type of work that we do. Um, essentially, we decentralize stormwater management by taking rain, so looking at climate adaptation, capturing that full value to prevent combined sewer overflows, um, to create a potable water offset, um, and to virtually eliminate stormwater. So what can be done to incentivize governments to create stormwater levies and the types of regulations that also create the financing for climate adaptation? Because we're hearing a lot more interest in climate mitigation right now, but we have to face the reality, which is climate change is happening now. Can, can you tell me what, uh, what mm -hmm. company? Uh, I didn't hear that. Just Rain Grid. Thank you very much. Does someone want to uh, address that question directly? I won't try to be an expert on storm water, but I can talk about adaptation more broadly. I think, you know, you're very right in saying that mitigation has been, you know, the focus of climate policy, I think, for a long time in Canada. We talk about adaptation as the poor cousin. Uh, I think that's changing largely because we are seeing the impacts of climate change in Canada today, and it's growing and it's getting scary. And I think that's forcing governments to have to uh, you know, deal with that. Uh, so I think having really clear frameworks across governments of how they're, you know, identifying climate impacts, how they're adapting to them will help drive that progress. And, you know, in those strategies, having very clear indicators of how they're planning to address, you know, the range of different climate impacts that we're expecting in Canada. Uh, so, you know, clear governance structures, uh, I think, is one solution to that challenge. Maybe I can't speak to the urban interface to the same extent, but I will say um, in agriculture, I think water infrastructure is gaining a lot of uh, recognition and importance. We saw the BC government just recently announce $80 million to invest in water infrastructure for farms, recognizing this multi-year drought implications that are affecting a lot of our sector. And so I think when you're looking at it from a government perspective, right now, every year we are spending hundreds of million dollars on disaster recovery. And I think there's a real... Um, 
acute understanding within governmental circles this can't persist. This is not the way we need to be operating, and it is driving more and more focus on what are the prevention and mitigation steps that can be taken, and water infrastructure is, I think, just growing in prominence. So I do expect, well, I don't think there'll be a, you know, a leapfrog in terms of jumping in with two feet and progress on, uh, you know, how quickly this all happens. I do think that there is a growing understanding that we need to be spending a lot more time on water infrastructure and a lot more energy on that to avoid what is becoming a perennial cost to government that's really not sustainable or predictable. Uh, thank you. Um, we have. Uh, I have one final question for the panelists, but if there is a question online, nope. Okay, so um, I will just uh, allow each of you some kind of wrap-up thoughts, but I will frame them in the context of a question uh, or a series of questions. Uh, you know, who is doing this well? Like if you look around the world, are there countries or sectors uh, or jurisdictions uh, that you think we should be learning from that are using digital policy to drive climate action or vice versa? Um, and kind of, is there one thing or a message or an action item that you'd like to leave with people here that you know is working elsewhere? So not theoretical, but something that uh, you've learned uh, looking around the world and say this is something that we should be doing more of here in Canada. And I'll start with Anna. Sure, maybe I'll provide kind of a high level example and then a specific one. Uh, I think at a high level, it looks like the EU is doing a relatively good job about thinking about digital and climate holistically. I think we're seeing increasingly, you know, digital solutions recognized in their energy and climate plans. Um, and I think that's partly driven by, you know, regulations in the EU, EU that are driving the need for that. Uh, they really talk about the green and the digital transition in the same breath. Uh, I think a really specific example, and I'm going to come back to my electricity stuff, uh, but a really specific example that I think <clears throat> provides a good lesson for Canada is the relatively recent uh, UK smart uh, EV charging regulations that are requiring all new electric vehicle chargers, I believe just installed in residential buildings, uh, to have some sort of smart functionality. So for example, that means the ability to delay uh, charging to when you know load is lower or when more renewables are online. Uh, and I think that's a really strong example of where governments are providing a clear push where they see a technology that has great potential, a digital solution that has great potential potential um, to advance the clean energy transition and are making that drive uh, to see increased uptake. I think what I would just, I'd speak to something I touched on before, but is around the, the, and this is not so much for government, but more of an industry centric comment is that the need to look at uh, what the US and Australia have done in terms of digital codes of conduct for agriculture. I think there's a lot of work that's already been done in that space that we should be looking to to take advantage of. It's uh, Canada has its own unique considerations. And I will say when we look at digital connectivity in particular, I think the size of our country, our relative population density, all create some very unique challenges. but. Um, just looking at creating the right enabling conditions, I think uh, we in Canada really need to take a step towards having a much more acute sense of uh, what the principles that need to underpin data sharing agreements are uh, to support more interoperability in, in AI and machine learning systems in agriculture as well is, is really a vital step that we need to take right away. And I think one of the ways of doing what uh, what Scott just mentioned uh, and also integrating discussions around connectivity climate policy and how it can help reduce emissions is create a national strategy on digitization in Canada. Have Canada be a leader on digital policy on the global stage. Uh, in order to do that, we need to bring stakeholders from uh, across emitting sectors to the table, government agencies and departments to the table, have the discussion about what we can do as a country uh, to drive this idea of digital policy as a part of climate policy forward. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, so, uh, Sangeeta from uh, TELUS Agriculture, uh, Scott from the CFA, uh, and Anna from uh, uh, the Climate Institute, I'd just like to thank all of you for this uh, quite informative discussion, and I'd invite people to join me in thanking them. Thank you.